All right, this morning we're uh, continuing our series, More of Heaven. Uh, if you missed last week, go back and, and watch the, the stream of, of Pastor Weaver and Pastor Kerry. They, they were great messages. But uh, this morning, I'm sorry you're stuck with, you're stuck with me, so good luck. Uh, and tonight, uh, you get Pastor Luke, and it's, it's going to be a great word tonight. So make sure you get back here at, at 6 p.m. And like they said, uh, all week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, one of my good friends, uh, Evangelist Micah Mack, is going to be here, and, and he, is a, he is a good friend of New Hope. He was texting Pastor Luke and myself yesterday, just sharing what he was going to be preaching on, and uh, he was saying uh, that these are brand new messages. A lot of times you get an evangelist, and they re-preach a lot of the same. These are brand new messages that he wrote that he felt like God was just leading him into uh, for this next week. So make sure that you are here uh, each one of those nights as we talk about more of heaven, more of God, and, and revival. And maybe you're saying, well, well, what is revival? Well, that's funny that you ask, because here's the definition of revival. Definition number one, an improvement in the condition or strength of something. How many know that we need an improvement in the condition and the strength of our country spiritually? Right? We need an improvement. Maybe it's in, in your own life. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your community, your school, your workplace. We need an improvement in the condition and strength spiritually. The second definition is this, an instance of something becoming popular, active, or important again. It's time. We're due. We're due. Can you imagine what it would look like in our country if our country turned and, and, and turned to God? And, and the whole country was, was worshiping and on fire for God. But guess what? It's not going to all of a sudden just everybody does it all at the same time. And it's going to be this big thing. It's got to start somewhere. So you know what I say? Why not here? Why not now? Why not start it in Des Moines? Why not start it in Urbandale? Why not start it in New Hope? What are, what are we waiting for? Let's, let's go after God and see what he does with it. Let's surrender everything to God, like Janie shared with the, the 1%. Let's give him everything and see what he does with that. But it's time that we make him famous in our schools, in our workplace, in our neighborhood. But before we can have a big revival, maybe you need a personal revival. Maybe you need a personal revival in your life. Something needs to improve spiritually. Something needs to strengthen up spiritually. Uh, something needs to become more popular again. Something needs to become more important again in your life. And maybe there's different things that are keeping you from it. A, a sin, lust, greed, lies, secrets, unforgiveness, whatever it is, uh, I want you to know that, that God, he wants to forgive you from that. And that, that we can have this personal revival and that we need this personal revival. So before we even really get started today, I just want to take a moment of just kind of silence, just listening to God, asking God this question. God, what things need to change in my life? If you just close your eyes and just ask God that question, what things need to change? What things need to improve? What have I done that, that it's not pleasing to you? And Jesus, I just, I pray right now, God, that you would just begin to reveal different things to people, give them thoughts, put things on their heart, things that need to change, of things that, that are not right, right now with them, God. And I pray that, that as we go through this morning, as we go through this, this series, God, that we would turn to you, that we would give up every little bit that we have, that we would fully surrender, and that we would have all that you have for us. Speak to us, open our, our eyes and our hearts and our ears, just like we sang, to, to be in tune with your spirit. I pray that your spirit would fall here today. I pray you would give me the words to say, take out the things that I shouldn't say, and we invite your presence here, and we pray, amen. Whatever it is God's revealing to you, I want you to know, like I said, he wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. And as we were talking about, about this series more of heaven, one thing that we felt was so vital to having revival is forgiveness. Forgiveness was something that, that we felt was so vital. Forgiveness from God, but also forgiving others. And maybe it's forgiving yourself, but we feel like this was such an important thing. Who here has ever had to forgive somebody? If you haven't ever had to forgive someone, then take some notes this morning, because I'm sure you need to. You got a long list. Uh, but we, we have to forgive someone. And how many know that forgiving people isn't always easy? It's not an easy thing to do. It's actually very hard. I wish it was an easy thing to do. I think, I, I kind of picture it being two brothers. And the, the two brothers are outside playing on their swing set or whatever. And, and one of the brothers, like a brother does, punches the other one. Right? You, you got that mental picture in your head? The brother punches the other one. And the brother just got punched, comes running inside crying to his dad. Right? And the dad calls in the other brother and he kind of does one of these. 
Like he knows, he knows what's up. And he gets in, he says, did you punch your brother? Yeah, yeah, I did. He's like, all right, say sorry. Sorry, right? You, you guys got the picture, right? It's like, all right, what do you say? I forgive you. All right, now go play. And then they just run back outside like nothing ever happened. I wish it was that easy for us. Where it's, where it's, I'm sorry, I forgive you, all right, let's go play on the swing set, right? Like, I wish it was that easy, but unfortunately it's not because Satan wants you to hold on to a grudge. He wants you to bury it down deep. He, he doesn't want you to deal with it. And, 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 and what we see today is I'm looking at two different points in Scripture that talk about forgiveness. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, so you can go ahead and turn to Matthew. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 18, and then we're going to jump to Matthew chapter 5. But we see all throughout the Bible, there, there's all this about forgiveness, and this was such a uh, broad area. There's so many scriptures that it could have been used today, but this is where we're going to be in Matthew 18. We're going to start in verse 21. Matthew chapter 18, starting verse 21. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screens behind me. It says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Some versions say seven times 70 times, which if you're a math wizard, that's 490. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, which translated today is seven and a half billion dollars. I don't know how you get that much debt or who gives someone money that much, but this is what happened. Seven and a half billion dollars was brought to him, uh, the, the man that owed him was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. I don't know how you're going to pay back seven and a half billion dollars, but <laughs> the servant's master took pity on him. Some virgins say had compassion on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of the, one of the fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which translated $11,000. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. He, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had him thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Verse 35, this is key. If you have a Bible, underline this in your Bible. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here's what I want you to see is that if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. Ouch. If we do not forgive others, God does not forgive us. The first point that we see today is this, is Jesus is forgiveness and freedom. Jesus is forgiveness and freedom. I want you to know there's nothing about Jesus that wants you to be bound to something that will hurt you. There's nothing about him that wants that. Satan, he wants you to be bound to some sort of bitterness, anger, uh, addiction. He, he, he wants that, but Jesus wants you to have freedom. We know that it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. There, there is freedom. But Jesus says, I'm not just going to have compassion. I'm not just going to stop at compassion. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, I feel so bad for you. But he had so much compassion that he's actually moved to action. Where he, where he forgives us and he says, I'm going to give you freedom. Because it's one thing to feel something, it's another thing to do something. It's one thing to feel something like, oh, I should do that. It's another thing to actually do it. And God, he wants to forgive you. How awesome is that, that we serve a God that not, doesn't just forgive us, but that he wants to forgive us, amen? That that's something that he wants to do. I remember this one time in high school, uh, I, I had gotten a gift card to, I don't remember if it was like Applebee's or Buffalo Wild Wings or something, but I had gotten this gift card, so I went with a friend or two, and, and because I had a gift card, I'm thinking, I'm going to treat myself to something nice, right? I'm going to treat myself. So I, I, I got an appetizer, I got a pop, I got a main entree, I got a dessert, I got, I got everything, right? Like it, so much food, you're not even eating everything, you know what I'm talking about? Like you're just trying to use the whole gift card up in one time. So I go to pay for it, a, 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 a couple seconds later the waitress comes back and is like, oh, there's nothing on this gift card, <laughs> right? 
So I, lo I look at the bill and I'm like, oh my God, how does this cost so much? Like three bucks for a pop? Are you? And I start to wonder this. I'm like, what in the world? But how many know that when it comes to sin, we've racked up the bill and we can't afford it? We've racked it up and we can't afford it, but Jesus came and he paid the ultimate price for you and me. He, he's paid the price. He's wiped the debt away. Jesus wants to forgive you so that you can forgive others. He wants to forgive you so that you can forgive others. And he's saying that when you, when you weigh it out, when you try to compare what people have done to you and what they've done to me, it doesn't even come close. It's like seven and a half billion dollars and eleven thousand dollars. But we think, God, I can't forgive them. They've hurt me so bad. How am I ever supposed to forgive them for that? And we have this, we have this scale that we weigh things that people do to us. And we have this, we have this whole weight system of, of well, they did this to me, and they, they said this to me, and they talked behind my back and all these different things, and, and, and we just add up all the things that people do to us. They, they were abusive to me, and we're saying, God, how can I ever forgive them? This is fully weighed down. They, they, I'm maxed out. They, it can't even weigh anymore. And Jesus says, well, you're looking at it all wrong. You see, you have your scale, but I have my scale. And we put this over here, and if you were able to see this, you would see that it barely even breaks the surface. He's got a much bigger scale than we do. He's saying, I, I, I've forgiven them of so much more than this. Can't you forgive of just just a little bit. He's saying, when you weigh it out, it doesn't even compare. I dropped this first service, and I thought it broke. A little scary, so I'm gonna be gentle this time. He's saying, it doesn't, it doesn't even compare. It's like seven and a half billion and 11,000. It, it doesn't come close. And what, what we see is that this servant, he was forgiven, and he had this grace shown to him, and rather than re reciprocating it, he actually acts very harshly to this other person, so much so that it says he choked him out. He choked him out, demanding that, that he pay him back. It says a lot about who you are, the way you deal with others. It says a lot about who you are, the way that you deal with other people. Jesus says the one who has been forgiven much, he loves much. But we see after this guy's forgiven, he goes and he demands, and this guy begs him. And if you look at it, he says almost the exact same thing this guy just said to his master. Almost the exact same thing. But it says a lot about who you are. So many of us, we, we, we want forgiveness. We, we, he begged him and he wanted that forgiveness, but you don't want to give forgiveness. You want to be forgiven, but you don't want to forgive. You want to be blessed, but you don't want to bless. It says a lot about who you are, the way that you deal with other people. At the beginning of this verse, we see this question asked, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Point number two is this, throw your calculations out the window. Throw your calculations out the window. Jesus says, don't forgive seven times, forgive 77 times. Forgive seven times 70 times. Now he's saying forgive 490 times and then you don't have to ever forgive again. You're all good. No, he's saying don't, don't add it up, don't count it up, just keep doing it. Just keep going. We see that this is a theme all throughout the Bible of, of don't, don't add it up. Don't throw the calculations out. We see the rich young ruler. He says, what do I have to do? Jesus says, sell everything. He, he says this extreme statement, get rid of everything. We, we see that we ask this question, how much do I have to tithe? 10%? He says, no, you give out of your heart and you give your life. Man, so many times as Christians, we, we want the black and white. What, what can I do? What can't I do? And we say, oh, I can do this, and I can get as far up to this line, but if I cross this, I'm good. Where's the line at, God? Tell me where it is. But he's saying, don't get as close to the line as you can. Get as far from the line as you can. Go above and beyond. Don't just, don't just, don't just get right up to it and do exactly what you have to do. Go far above it. And we see this perfect example in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21 of this. Matthew 5, 21, it says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Here we have this, this, this series of, of these six theological upgrades that he's giving us. What, what was passed down to Moses and became diluted, and now he's reteaching it. He begins with this thought that long before something happened in your life, it happened in your heart. Long before it happens in your life, it happens in your heart. And we see this command, now shall not murder. And if you murder, you'll be subject to judgment. Verse 22, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, I don't know what that means. Sounds like a cuss word though, doesn't it? Sounds mean. Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. 
scares me a little bit. I've said worse things than you, fool. And Raka. What we're saying here is, is what starts in the heart doesn't stay in the heart. What starts as a thought turns into an action, and that action can turn your life into a living hell. Did you know that, that you can turn your life into a living hell just by what you allow to have access to your heart? I, I, I think of it uh, as this. When it, when it comes to forgiveness, I want to forgive my wife, Maren, before she ever apologizes for the offense. I, I want to do it quickly. And I, th- I think of it like this. Anybody ever had a hangnail before? You ever had a hangnail? And it, it's something that starts off so small, and it seems so insignificant. But if you don't deal with it right away, it will irritate you on a whole different level. And this is how offense works in our life. That if we don't deal with it, it, it irritates us. It seems so small at first, like they just offended me, and it, and it seems so small, but, but if you don't deal with it, it results in a constant pain. You see, when we see unforgiveness, it almost always begins with someone being offended. Forgiveness always begins with someone being offended. So how do we stop it? Point number three is this, is we forgive quickly. We forgive quickly. Some of you say, forgive quickly? I'll forgive if they would apologize. I'll forgive if they would would meet me in the middle somewhere. That's because you don't have a revelation of what forgiveness is. You think forgiveness is all about justice. Forgiveness is all about making things right. They, They gotta be even. But see, forgiveness is not about justice. Forgiveness is all about freedom. When you harbor offense, you're not hurting that other person. You're only hurting yourself. It's, it's all about freedom. Martin Luther King said this, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It's a constant attitude. It's a constant attitude. You say, well, well I can't be quick to forgive. Why not? You're quick to get offended. You're quick to gossip. You're quick to strike back. You're quick to hurt the other person. You're quick to isolate. Why not take all of that and put that towards forgiveness? Have you ever noticed that we live in a time where everyone's offended, right? It seems like everyone's offended by everything all the time, right? Like I can't even post anything on Instagram without having to pray for like 20 minutes to make sure someone's not gonna be offended by what I'm posting. You know what else I've noticed is that Christians are some of the most offended people on the planet. Which is ironic because our whole religion is based upon a relationship with someone who dropped every offense we ever committed against him. Kind of weird to me. We gotta be careful because people get, they get really offended and maybe you find that, that you get really offended. And what you find is that you're unhappy. Maybe the reason it's hard for you to stay happy is because it's so easy for you to get offended. You wanna make it easier to stay happy, make it harder to get offended. It, it all comes back to offense. And Jesus says, if you entertain it, that it will turn your life into a living hell. And what we have here in, in Matthew 5 is this playbook of how the enemy is going to try to get in, of how he tries to, tries to ruin your life. And, and here it is. His, the enemy's agenda is destruction. It's destruction. John 10, 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy you. And his strategy is division. Matthew 12, 25 says every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household against itself will not stand. Understand, he wants to destroy you, and he'll do it by dividing you. And his tactic is offense. It's offense. Satan has an offensive strategy. He's subtle about it. He, he, if he wasn't subtle, you wouldn't fall for it. I think about it uh, like, say I have a, a mice problem at my house. Mouse problem, mice problem. What is it? Mice. There's more than one. Let's say I have a, a mice problem, and, and I set up uh, all these traps all around the house, and there's cheese on it because... That's how the cartoons catch one, so that's what I'm going to do. All right, and I set up all these, these mouse traps. How do you know that when Maren wakes up in the morning and she's hangry and coming down to get breakfast, she's not going to see the mouse trap and go, oh, cheese, that looks so good. All right, she's not going to go grab it. She's going to see it and say, that's, that's a trap. I'm not going to touch that, that piece of cheese. But Barrett, my one-year-old son, he's going to see it, and he has no idea that that's a trap, and he's going to go right for it, and he's going to pick it up. Satan, he, he's, he's strategic. He doesn't put something in front of you that looks like a trap. If he came into your relationship, he's like, hey, I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy your relationship. You wouldn't stand for that. You'd say, absolutely not. But, but he's, he's, he's strategic, and he gets in. He puts this little trap in your way, and he does it by using the smallest offense, little offenses, one after the other. 
He, and that, that's how he tries to get in. Has anyone ever heard about the verse of dealing with a plank in your eye before talking about the speck in someone else's eye? Right? Here you are with a, a big old plank in your eye, whacking everyone across the face, talking about the speck in their eye, but here you are with this problem. You know what I've noticed about a plank? Is it's just a bunch of specks built up. If we don't learn to deal with the speck, it will turn into a plank. We gotta do it quickly. We gotta do it very, very quickly. We need to deal with it before it builds up. Maybe it's a family member you're holding a grudge against, a close friend that, that you can't seem to forgive. But we see that this statement is true that the closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity. The closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity. It goes two ways, for intimacy, and the closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity for offense. That's why, that's why no one can make you as mad as someone you love. No one can hurt, hurt you like someone you've given your heart to. This is why we see divorce as, as such a big issue. Divorce, friendships being ruined, families being divided. It all happens one offense at a time. Verse 23 says this, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. I want you to see that uh, this, is a, this is a big point for, for us in the series more of heaven, that you can't even properly connect with God if you have unforgiveness in your heart. You can't have more of heaven with unforgiveness in your heart. It says if you come into the altar, if you, if you bring in your gifts, if you bring in your worship, that, that you need to leave and deal with things before you come back and offer that gift. We can't properly connect with God with unforgiveness, with offense in our hearts. And watch how bad it gets. Verse 25, it says this. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. What's an adversary? It's your enemy, right? So, so this confused me at first because in verse 22, we're talking about deal with things with your brother or sister, and now why are we talking about a different person? Why are we talking about our enemy? Or is it possible that this is the same person? That the person in verse 22 that you didn't deal with things, your brother, your sister went and you didn't deal with things, by the time verse 25 rolls around, now they're, there, now they're your enemy. It's, it's the same person. This is what happens when we let little offenses come in. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still on the way with him, or he may have, hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you paid the last penny. It all started with Raka. It all started with, with an argument. It all started with, with an argument in the car. It all started with a comment on social media. In the moment, you, you don't think everything's, this relationship's over. I had one, they did one little thing, this relationship's over. You don't think that your friendship is going to be ruined. You don't have one offense come in and think that you two are going to be sitting down with an attorney dividing your assets. It's not one thing and done. It happens one offense at a time. They build up and they build up over time. We see the agenda is destruction, his strategy is division, and his tactic is offense. So this morning, I, I want to show you what this looks like. Is that, is that all right with you? Anybody visual learner like me? Good, I'm glad there's four. This will be great for you. Uh, so I have a couple people that I'm going to have help me. Can I have Jordan and Danielle come up? Yeah, give it up for Jordan and Danielle. I just went and asked them a couple minutes ago if I could use them, and they were hesitant, but I paid them off. First service, this is great. It was this newlywed couple that I just randomly called up, like, and they started to, he about started to give me actual examples of offense that they had. It was, we were getting some real good marital counseling going on here. Was, this is going to be good. But we see that, that God wants to take the two, and he wants to make them one. You can stand close. How long have you guys been married? Ten years. Ten years. Act like it, all right? There you go. There you go. He wants to take the two and make them one, but the enemy wants to take the one and do what? Make them two, right? All right, separate, all right? Leave some room for Jesus, Jordan. <laughs> Calm down. Been married 10 years. Understand this, that, that it's, offenses will come into your relationship, right? Anybody ever been hurt by something someone said or did to you, right? We all would have our hands up. Anybody ever unintentionally hurt somebody by something you said? right? It's, it's not a matter of if offenses come into your relationship, it's what you do with it when they do come into your relationship, 
We, we, there's always going to be an offense. So, so I have this fence, and what I want you to see here is this, is that this fence represents offense. <laughs> so I'm going to give this to Danielle. She has this offense because uh, Jordan being a guy, sometimes guys say stupid stuff. Anybody ever on either side of that picture, you've been a you can attest to that. Sometimes guys say stupid stuff. It was unintentional, but he said something stupid, and now he's given her this offense. Or maybe it's not just something you say, it's something that you don't do, right? An unmet expectation. You know how we have unmet expectations? Unexpressed expectations. You want to have your expectations meet? You need to express them. But let's say growing up, and, and I'm just throwing this out here for you guys. This could be true. If it is, then we're going to work through it right now. <laughs> but let's say growing up that, that Danielle, birthdays were a big deal in her family. They were like this, this big celebration. Her parents would wake her up at 3 a.m. They would take her out to breakfast. She would come home and have like 20 birthday presents to open. Right? They'd give her a tiara and a sash to go to school. And she'd just walk around like this. They would come and pick her up for, for lunch and take her out to eat. And then when she'd get home after school, she had like 20 more gifts to open. Like it was just this, this big deal in her family. But for Jordan, oh Jordan. <laughs> but for Jordan, birthdays weren't a big deal in his family. His family is more the type that's like, why should we celebrate you just popped out and came into the world? Like you didn't do anything to deserve that. Right? That, that was more his side. Of, that was more what his family would do. And, and they kind of felt that way. So let's rewind 10 years, and let's say it, it's your first year being married, and it's Daniel's first birthday as a married couple, and she has all these expectations. He's going to take me out to breakfast. He's going to get me a new car, right? All, all of these things for her birthday. And she wakes up, and she's just laying there with her eyes awake, like, come on, wake up, wake up. Here, here we go. He's saving up some big surprise, right? And Jordan he knows that birthdays are a big deal, so he's thinking like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a nice reservation for dinner, and it's going to be great. I'm going to do something nice for her for her birthday. But he doesn't really realize how big of a deal. So Jordan wakes up that morning, and he says, oh, happy birthday, honey, and gives her a kiss and goes to work. And now he's left her with this offense. But see, she's not the only one who gets offended in this relationship. Jordan, he works, he works really hard, right? That is true. I do know you work really hard. He works really hard for his money, and they're newlyweds right now, so they're trying to save up. They want to buy a house. They want to, uh, they want to have kids soon, so they're trying to save up and all this stuff. And, 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 but one problem we see is that Danielle, one of her hobbies is shopping. <laughs> she said coffee. <laughs> But one of her problems is shopping. So here's Jordan on a, on a Saturday morning, just worked a long week, worked real hard. And, and here's Danielle, and she walks in, and Jordan's just kind of hanging out, relaxed on Saturday morning. She's got bags all around her arms, right? Like she's walking in, she can like barely hold all the bags. And he sees this, and, and, and she says, oh, don't worry though, Jordan, because I got it all on, all on sale. And now she's handed him this offense. And now, now we see that Jordan, he, he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to go to bed at night, and this is what the devil wants. He's trying to go to bed, and he's thinking, man, she doesn't, she doesn't respect me. She doesn't care that I, that I worked so hard for this money. And Satan's saying, yeah, that's right. She doesn't care. She doesn't respect you, and he buries it down deep. Now, now time out real quick. I recognize that these are a little stereotypical illustrations I used here, right? I understand that men work hard for their money, that women work hard for their money, that girls like to shop, that guys like to shop. This was just an example, and if you just got offended by what I just said, <laughs> take some notes. <laughs> but but here's, here's Danielle, and it's like four months after her birthday, and she's still thinking, man, Jordan doesn't really love me like I thought he did. He doesn't care that it was my birthday. He just took me out to like the nicest restaurant. That's it. That's all he did. It's insane. Yeah, she, he doesn't care about you. He, he, he doesn't think that your birthday's a big deal. He doesn't love you like you thought he did. And, and she buries it down deep. But like I said, the, the closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity. Which also means because, because that person is your brother, because that person's your sister, because they are your best friend, because they are your spouse, the more intimate the relationship, the more infinite the possibilities. We're about to work through some stuff here. 
10 years of marriage all coming out right now. But uh, maybe he says something to you that you don't like and you bury it down. Maybe Jordan, uh, he needs a haircut and rather, easy. <laughs> rather than getting a haircut from Danielle, he goes to some, he goes to sport clips. <laughs> Was that right? Is that true? Did that happen? No, but he can if he oh. wants to. Oh, he can. <laughs> it's free. I'm not getting paid for uh, She thinks, does he ever clean around here? Right? He says uh, she's a terrible driver. True. He never asks for directions. She never shuts up. <laughs> no, it's fine, Jordan. I'll get up with the kids again. You got to work in the morning. Right? Buries it down deep. No, it's, it's fine, Danielle. I'll take out the trash again. I think I'm the only one around here, but I'll take it out. And you don't realize it because it's happening one offense at a time. Stay there, Jordan. You're in trouble. You don't realize it because it's happening one small piece at a time, but before you realize it, what started as offense, the two are now divided because of a fence. And what we see is the next point is that offense builds a fence. Offense, it, it builds Offense. You don't realize it's happening because it's, it's one thing at a time. It's one small thing at a time. But before you realize it, it turns into this. And now Jordan is in this prison of offense. And what you need to see is that, that Danielle didn't put Jordan in this prison. He built this. He put himself in this prison. It's not the other person that's doing this. It's you that put yourself there. It's you that harbored the offense. So how do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we, how do we get back to, to not being divided, but how do we get back to the two becoming one again? It's simple. It looks something like this. Drop it. That's the next point, is we have to learn to drop it. You know, when we, when we think about it, if only we could find someone who had every right to be offended. If only we could find someone who had every right to stand at a distance, but what did he do? He opened up his arms for us, right? He opened up his arms and said, Father, forgive them, and we have to learn to drop it. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying suppress it. I'm not saying bury it down deep. I'm not saying don't deal with it, but what I'm saying is this, is after you've had the conversation of, Danielle, I don't like it when you drive because I'm afraid I'm gonna die. And after you have the conversation, uh, Jordan, uh, what else did I say? I can't remember. Jordan, I don't like when you go to sport clips to get a haircut. You drop it, right? You, 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 don't, you don't hold on to it. You don't bury it down deep, but you have the conversation and then you Drop it, drop it, there you go. You can't control what's handed to you, but you can control what you do with it, and we have to learn to drop it. Thank you guys. Give it up for Jordan and Danielle. We have to learn to drop it. That's so key to, to not having unforgiveness. Which, by the way, unforgiveness is not even a word, yet so many of us struggle with it. But we have to learn to drop it. The Bible says that if, if you have unforgiveness in your heart and you come into church, that you can't even properly connect with God until you are reconciled with that person. You can't even properly give him a gift of worship, give him a gift at the altar, unless you fix that relationship, unless you learn to drop it. Lewis Schmid says this, Forgiveness is letting the prisoner free and finding out that the prisoner was you. It's letting the prisoner free and finding out, I, I was the one that was kept in prison all this time. I was the one that was holding on to this. Most of the time, they don't even know that they did something. And here we are holding on to it. He said, you gotta do this while you're on the way or this will not end well for you. If God dropped all the charges against you, what offense is there in the universe that we have to hold against someone else? I want you to see this, that, that offense, it is, is, uh, offense is an event, but offended is a decision. To live offended is to deny the very nature of the salvation that has saved you. We have to learn to forgive. If you would stand across this room this morning, 
The last point that I want you to see this morning is this, is that we are forgiven to forgive. We have been forgiven to forgive. It says that he who has been forgiven of much loves much. He has been forgiven of much, forgives much. He loves much. All throughout the Bible, we see that forgiveness is, is, such, a, is such a constant uh, thing, that a main point that comes up all throughout the Bible. Even Jesus on the cross, one of the last things he said is, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. He was dying on the cross for something he didn't do, and he said, forgive them. He had every right, but yet he, he didn't hold it against them. We have to learn to forgive. Maybe there's people today that you need to forgive. Maybe there's someone in this very room today that you need to forgive. Maybe it's, it's a family member. Maybe it's someone at work. And, and maybe you need to send a text here in just a moment saying, hey, can we meet up and talk? Hey, I need to talk about something because we have to do it quickly. We don't know how much time we have. And it says, if you don't forgive others, that God won't forgive you. That's scary. We have to learn to forgive. Maybe this morning, as, as we took that time of prayer at the beginning, there was something revealed to your heart, and, and you need to ask God for forgiveness of that thing. You need to forgive someone else of something that you've been holding against them, and then you need to go to God and say, God, forgive me of this. I, I, it was unintentional. Maybe it was intentional. Maybe whatever it is, but we need to seek after God, asking him for forgiveness. But forgiving other people, forgiving yourself, forgiving, uh, asking God for forgiveness, it all points back to God. It all points back to having more of heaven. It all points back to having more of God. So here's how I want to close this morning. Maybe, like I said, there's someone here that you need to forgive, and you're going to have to leave your seat, and it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be awkward, but maybe you need to find someone, and you just need to have a conversation with them. I know that's awkward, but can you imagine how awkward and uncomfortable it would be if someday when we get to heaven, God said, well, you didn't forgive that person, so what am I supposed to do with you? But maybe there's someone here that you need to forgive. Maybe, like I said, it's a text message. Maybe it's, it's just asking God for forgiveness. It's, it's coming to the altars. Like I said, though, whatever it is, it all points back to God. all points back to having more of heaven. And let's start this, this week it off of, of all these services of just seeking after God right now, of, of lifting up his name, of worshiping him, of filling the altars and going after him. Whatever it is, you know the steps that you need to take. You know the person you need to talk to. Let's deal with it quickly. I'm gonna pray and they're gonna go into worship. Dear Jesus, I thank you this morning that you forgive us. That even though we don't deserve it, that you still freely pour it out on us. And I pray that we would be more like you and that we would learn to forgive others. That we would not harbor offenses, God, but, but we would forgive others quickly. I pray you would reveal different things to people's hearts right now of, of people that they've they have uh, yet to forgive of, of things that we have yet to ask for forgiveness for, God, that, that we would come full on for you, that, that we would be fully surrendered to you, saying, God, you can have every single part of me. God, I pray that revival would begin to take place, that, that we would begin to seek your face, seek your heart, seek what you want for us, your plan for us, God, and that, that this would be a place where this whole thing starts. Why not here? Why not now? Pour out your presence, pour out your Holy Spirit on this place. We want more of you this morning. And your name we pray, amen. Here's one thing I love about Jesus is he doesn't forgive us and then like, all right, now I'm just gonna store this up and then, you know, if I need to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it as ammo against, you know, it says, it throws into the sea of forgetfulness. It, as far as the east is from the west, we don't have to live with that anymore. It, it's, it's gone. Never to be talked about again. Let's forgive people. Let's do it quickly. Let's love people like Christ loves us. Let's be the light in the city. Let's go out. Let's have more of heaven, not just on Sunday morning, not just Sunday night, not just Wednesday night. Let's have more of heaven everywhere, all the time. Amen? Dear Jesus, I thank you for each person here this morning. God, I pray that we would learn to forgive. I pray that we would go into our, into our city, into our schools, into our workplaces, into our families, in our neighborhoods. God, that, that we would go in with your light, that we would go in forgiving people, that they would see something different about us because we don't, we don't talk about other people, because we don't hold grudges against other people, but we forgive quickly, that we love every single person around us. Even when it's difficult, God, I pray you would give us strength to love those who are difficult to love. God, let us be different. Let's be different than the world around us. Let us seek after you wholeheartedly, 100%.
God, I pray you would, you would begin revival here. I pray that tonight, that this week, that we would see salvations, that we would see miracles, that we would see healings, God, that, that there would just, that your spirit would just be so evident here, God. We want more of you. I pray you'd bless each person as they leave, that you'd bless them to be a blessing, that we would find people that, that we can bless, that we can love. Open our eyes to that, God. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So now we go and we forgive and we love. We'll see you guys back tonight.